Hi everybody, I'm Dave Kaufman. You know, in herpticulture there are celebrities. People who have dedicated their entire lives to the further advancement of our knowledge of reptiles and of herpticulture itself. And Tom Crutchfield is on the top of that list. And I'm here in southern Florida right now, and I'm about to go check out Tom's incredible and very famous collection, here on Zilla Presents Herpers TV. I'm a herper, herper, herper. I'm a herper, I'm a herper, and I like you. I actually was born with, I think, a genetic predisposition to love reptiles. I can't remember really not liking them. My earliest recollections of snakes was catching ringneck snakes in my yard. Well, I was born in North Florida when I was four or five years old, keeping them in jars and trying to feed them cheese. That's how ignorant I was. But uh, and I progressed from there to other things, and over the years to venomous and to crocodiles and uh, what you see now. I just never grew up, I don't guess. I'm not just like a guy that has just one kind of reptiles. I mean, I've always had all kinds of reptiles. I mean, I bred probably over 50 kinds of boids, 11 species of crocodilians. I don't know how many kinds of turtles and tortoises. And, four species of soccer, I don't know how many types of other lizards and stuff. I like all of it, you know, so. I've been doing this really since I was a very young man. I started catching snakes and selling them to, and instead of getting summer jobs. And later on, I worked at places that had reptiles like Ross Allen's and Denny Seabolt's and Snakeatorium and so forth. And, and then I sort of uh, did reptile shows at schools and bought and sold reptiles and caught reptiles and just made money any way I could for a while. And then. My first mail order business was opened around 1979, and it was called uh, Herpetofauna Incorporated. And that was the very first one, and that became very large and very famous. And the rest is history, sort of. We have a relationship with a lot of the animals here, you know, sort of a personal relationship, especially with certain ones. And the rock iguanas are certainly special lizards and special animals. And, and when we get stuff like this, I mean, these will be here until I die or until they die, you know, I mean, they won't go anywhere. Uh, a large number of them I have now, almost all of them I produce myself. All the real old ones that we brought back are pretty much gone now from the 70s. So, it's just, uh, you're really like old friends, you know. And these will outlive me and probably my grandkids too. He's only 11 years old, Roscoe, she's only 7. Uh, they'll live to be 80 or 90, and there may be more. I bred the very first albino ever produced in captivity in, uh, nine years ago, and I purchased the hats from a, a guy. Joe Lewis got a, a wild Colombian albino in, and he bred it to a, a male regular and produced hats. He sold the hats to a guy named Ed Bullion in uh, Atlanta, who had them for nine years and was never able to breed them. He sold them all to me. Seven months later, I had the first seven albinos, and the rest is history. The old strain is there in the next cage, the Colombians. And I had two more that I acquired that were imported in from El Salvador. And I raised them up and bred them back again and found out that they're not compatible. These were always prettier, and it's not the same gene. So if you breed the two together, you get all normals but double head. Going towards this type of an albino, though, it's, it's better, it grows faster, it takes more coal, and it's just an all-around lot prettier lizard. Uh, this year, we're, uh, we've been doing a lot of uh, new morph stuff, too. We actually now have uh, albino red iguanas, which we call crimsons, Crutchfield crimsons, and we have even albino super red iguanas, or albino, you know, called Crutchfield super crimsons. This is an unbelievable cage to look into. It's filled with regular Crutchfield albinos, Crutchfield crimsons, and Crutchfield super crimsons. These are basically super crimson iguanas. These are the super reds. Uh, there's crimsons and then there's super crimsons. These are the supers. And basically it's an albino red iguana, but one of the super reds, you know, which is a codom trait like a hypoboa. And these are still going to continue changing color for about another year and a half or two years. These should become solid blood red and a breeding color. I have no idea what they're going to look like, but it should be nothing less than spectacular to say the least. These are the very first ones in the world, so we have no idea what an adult looks like because there's never been one yet. Hey, this is... Um, an endemic boa to the island of Hispaniola in the Caribbean. Uh, there are actually four boas there. There are three boas of the genus Chilobophrus, of which this is one, and then there is one of the genus Tropidophis. This is a Chilobophrus fordi fordi, or forged ground boa, and they live in xeric type of habitat, very dry usually, and mostly in, in Haiti and the Antibaniti, and in the Dominican Republic in a place called Barahona, which is in the southwestern uh, Dominican Republic. And, uh, 
a little bit polymorphic, but most of them have blotches and sort of brown on brown and highly iridescent like all of the Chilobrophus and maybe getting about one meter in length at most, if that. Primarily feeding on cold-blooded prey, but they will eat warm-blooded prey when they get older. This is a male, probably 20 or 25 years old. It was this big when I got it. And all of these things I keep like this are a labor of love. I make no money on this at all. I just simply like them. In fact, most of everything that you see here is stuff because I like it. I, the iguanas pay for pretty much everything. These are boa constrictors that are endemic to the islands of Turks and Caicos, which are in the sort of southern Caribbean. Uh, these are Chilobothrus chrysogastra chrysogastra. Small species, maybe getting a meter and a half, possibly two meters long. But this is an adult uh, male here, and a newborn, a baby that was born in October this year. These have only been bred by three or four people in the whole world. Welcome to the Venomous Room, or welcome to one of the Venomous Rooms. This is actually one of the smaller ones, and most of the stuff in here is surplus with the exception of a few things. Venomous snakes have always been, to me, probably some of the most interesting, if not the most interesting reptiles on the planet. Venomous snakes bite you for one reason and one reason only, and that is they're afraid of you. A venomous snake does not attack humans. It will defend itself against humans. It will not attack human beings unless they feel threatened. So if you can see a snake, you're perfectly freaking safe. Because if you can see the snake, all you have to do is just walk away from it. And if you walk away from it, it will not pursue you. I promise you that. I'm going to show you that here in a second with a cobra. Let's just um Now you see what he did? See how he ran out and stopped? And you have to always expect the unexpected. Did you see how I moved back at just the right moment and just out of the range of the snake? Because if I had stayed there, he would have bit me on the chest. He's doing that because he's afraid. But because he is afraid, he's not going to sneak up behind me to bite. He's not going to run up and bite me on the neck or anything like that. He's only going to do that when I first open the box. It's just a threat. You follow me? But he's going to watch me. Now, I'm going to watch him, so it's all right. But cobras, what I do with venomous snakes mostly is I understand them. He speaks a language that I understand, and when he talks, I listen. And basically, I manipulate him into doing what I want by using the cobra's behavior against himself. Well, sit him right out on the table here. Just reach around and pet him on the head. If I wanted to pin it, I could pin it down like that and get it by the neck. It's all a matter of manipulation. You kind of see the behavior. If you notice now, <clears throat> see, being afraid of me like that, he doesn't, see, he doesn't advance forward at all. He just like sort of stands there and if I move, he'll move from side to side, but he's not going to advance towards me to bite. That's why I'm saying, if, you can, if you're out somewhere walking and you see a snake, that's all you need to know about snakes. You're perfectly safe. Just get the hell away from it. If you get the hell away from it, it's not going to bother you. It's not going to come after you to bite you. They will defend themselves, but that's it. So he's a good, uh, a good defensive cobra. He always defends himself. And uh, he sort of has a place in our heart. He'll always be here. Uh, we, we do produce venom from Nyakuthia for a uh, pharmaceutical company called Neutral Pharma. It's used in pain relief, believe it or not, for animals. And there's a lot of research going on also. So anyway, we're eventually going to have, uh, we right now have, I don't know, several hundred monocle cobras here on the venom line. Uh, you know, within a year, probably we'll have up to 3,000. I am uh, 67 years old. And I've been handling venomous snakes for over 50 years. And I've been free handling cobras first ones I did when I was 18 years old. And uh, I have still never been bitten handling a venomous snake. I've been bitten twice by a venomous snake through a bag, never handling one. In all the years I've been in business, we have had at my businesses a grand total of three venomous snake bites. And one of those included my bite through the bag with a West African Green Mamba that came from the uh, uh, Milwaukee Zoo that time. No, it was a dry bite, but I, I, I count it still. But there's some interesting uh, venomous snakes in here, too, that you don't normally see. For instance, if you were a, a soldier in Afghanistan, there are cobras in Afghanistan. They're called uh, Naya Oxiana, or Transcaucasian cobras, or Russian cobras. The venom of these cobras is certainly one of the most toxic, if not the most toxic, of all living cobras. There is no anti-venom for these here in the United States, so the bite would be fatal. The reason is Iran is the closest place that makes anti-venom, and of course we don't have too much dealings with Iran, so that's about as big as they get. 
See the narrow hood? An extremely virulent neurotoxic venom. I mean, that would kill your heart. It has a really powerful uh, myotoxin that affects the cardiac uh, muscles, and also they have a, you know, it'll shut your breathing down really quick. This is a black Pakistan cobra. This is one you don't see often either. This would be found in Pakistan. There's no anti-venom for this. The closest anti-venom made for this is in Iran again. Uh, the anti-venom made in India for spectacle cobras, which are the same species, is not uh, good against this. The venom is very different than the uh, Indian cobra. So we're not going to take any chances with this one either. This one will flat kill you. The venom is very toxic. There are three things that if you keep hot snakes that you should never do. And if you don't do any of these three things, the chances of you getting bit are not very good unless you just do something really stupid. First is, you never ever open a cage with your hand. You always open a cage with some utensil like this. Second of all, you never service that cage until you remove the snake. For instance, I would be stupid to try to reach in and grab that water bowl and take it out with that snake in it. I don't care if it's a little snake asleep in the back corner and I think it's never going to come out. We, the, the rule is you open the, the, the box with this hook, you take the snake out, put it in this can, take that top and secure it in the can, and then and only then do you clean the cage. When you get through, then you put the snake back and secure the cage again. And the third thing, never try to hold one behind the neck. Because most people that do do not know how, even the ones that do, and that's the, probably the best way to get bit of all. So don't do those three things. You do not have to be bitten by a venomous snake unless you don't have a lick of common sense. And I know they say it's common, but it ain't that common, so. Uh, this room has a lot of crotalis in it, you know, like rattlesnakes uh, of various kinds. A lot of western rattlesnakes I have, the beautiful uh, white Mitchell Ipyrus here, and Inyo, crotalis Inyo, and uh, a lot of rock rattlesnakes of different species, the ridge nose rattlesnakes, big albino eastern diamondback rattlesnakes. I produce these for babies. Now you notice how we're up at this big Eastern Diamondback rattlesnake cage and you see how long their rattles are and how, how big they are and they're laying there and you notice how they're not rattling? You might wonder why. Well, all of the venomous snakes that we raise here, we try not to scare them, even from the time they're babies. Like those are six years old. I, I produced them. They were born right here in this room. So they don't think of people or humans as a threat. So remember how I told you earlier how snakes bite you only because they're afraid of you? So even though it's genetically imprinted to be afraid of big animals, once over time, it's like a bird or something that's accustomed to the same thing. You know how birds imprint on people? I believe it's possible for reptiles too, and then they get to where they don't fear people. Doesn't mean they're not dangerous. It doesn't mean that you don't treat them like a venomous snake. It just means it makes it easier for you to deal with. And proof is here. Now I'm going to open the store. Now when I open, now right now, uh, someone could say that wanted to criticize me. They're going to say the rattlesnake doesn't know you're there because these two rattlesnakes are sleeping. So we're going to open the door so it engages its uh, heat sensors and it's going to know exactly where I am. It's going to know how big of an animal I am. It's going to see everything in infrared once I open this. So let's just see what he does. Now what he'll do half the time is he'll stick his head out of the cage with his tongue flicking just to look at me. Now right now I'm within range of this snake if he wanted to strike out and try to bite me if he wanted to. But the last thing in his mind is anything like that now. He's just extremely curious. There's nothing in this snake's body language that tells me it's any way at all upset with me. So it's relatively safe. Uh, everyone has always heard of Bushmasters, and uh, a lot of guys that like venomous snakes, of course, one of the holy grails is to have a Bushmaster. So what I'm going to show you now is a very large black-headed Bushmaster that's uh, captive bred and seven years old, which is perhaps the rarest of them all. And that's for Kesis melanocephala. And it's the large Bushmaster, of course, of the, uh, perhaps the largest pit viper in the world. They can reach a length of about three meters. Now, see, if I let it still go, it would have fell and it would have scared him. So I don't want to do that. See how I catch his tail? See? Little things like that would make a difference. And this is something that most hot herpers never take into consideration at all. Never. But for me, it's not about me, it's about the snake. And I want to understand them, I want to know, I, I, I want to like them, I want them to be happy, and I want to, be, I want to learn about them. Yeah, I never did this for anything other than it's something that I love. It's the only reason I've ever done it. I've never cared about fame, I don't care about any of it. I just really love the animals. And I love the earth, and I love my life. Uh, I hope to educate as many people as I can about reptiles, and how they're very different than what they think. It's the difference in fear, and pleasure is 
understanding, it's knowledge, it's nothing more than that. And the real key to happiness and tranquility in your life and peace is understanding your world and all of the inhabitants in your world. And once you're able to do that, then you'll of course understand yourself in the process and the rest gets easier. And most of us try to live in the past or we plan for the future so much instead of living in the now. We plan so much for the future that by the time the future gets here, we've just never lived our life at all. So don't make a mistake and do that. Live your life right now, every day. Because that's all you have is the right now. I wake up every morning with the wonderment of a five-year-old kid because I'm seeing the world for the first time literally. And I am because you only live in the now. And every day is a different day. And every day of my life I learn. And the more I learn, the less I realize I know. I've only begun to scratch the surface. Uh, uh, I have, like that Molly Hatchet song, I have dreams I'll never see, and that makes life uh, really worth living. To have dreams, so many dreams, that you know if you lived 150 years old, you'd never be able to do it all. So by God, that means I could just go, go, and go until I just can't. What's your opinion? How many years experience should someone have before they consider keeping venomous snakes? Comment below and share your opinion. You know, I've been doing Herper's TV for a couple of years now, let alone the years before that producing all three DVDs. And every time I visit somebody's collection or venture out into the field somewhere in the world, I gain a deeper knowledge, respect, and understanding for these reptiles that we all love so much. And going to Tom's collection and seeing some animals for the very first time as he slid open those drawers, that was an experience I will never forget. So we will see you next time on Zilla Presents Herper's TV.